Gentlemen, uh, thank you all for agreeing uh, to participate. Um, maybe starting uh, from uh, Bert, if you wouldn't mind just uh, introducing uh, yourself and just saying a little bit about uh, your background. Yes, okay. Hello, uh, everybody. My name is Bert. I'm from Europe, from Belgium. Um, a couple of years ago, I, um, I stopped my job at Biomaterial Science as a process engineer, and I started Trend Miner um, very young in the early days with respect of data analytics for, for process data. And today we are with 50 people, um, international, and trying to change the, uh, the process analytics. Thanks, Bert. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Subrat, uh, Subrat Tripathi. I represent uh, LNT Technology Services, one of the gold sponsors of this event. Uh, LNT Technology Services is a pure play service, uh, engineering service provider uh, globally. And we uh, provide these services with about 10,000 plus engineers that we have uh, operating out of uh, North America, Europe, and India. Uh, my personal responsibility uh, uh, is, is promoting our business in the industrial product segment in, in North America. Robert. Thanks. Uh, Robert Golightly with Aspen Tech. Um, about 35 years in manufacturing, 20 of it in advanced process control and manufacturing execution systems. And I'm currently running the marketing function for our asset performance management suite at Aspen. Uh, Mike Strobel, uh, I'm the uh, product manager for our system performance modeling uh, product at Aspen Tech. Uh, formerly, my company had created this, uh, this technology uh, 15 years ago, and we've been using it all over the world, and now we're uh, integrating that with a lot of the, the different uh, Aspen products and looking at more of a holistic system approach. Dr. Priyadarshi. Hi, I'm the Chief Data Scientist and Technology Fellow at Halliburton. I've been with the company for three, just less than three years, um, about uh, 15 years in big data space. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Um, so I just uh, have a question as a panel moderator. I, I'd like to st start with a, with a really tough one. Um, much of the discussion seems to center on the operational side of the, the work processes for the process industries. So what I'm wondering about is the um, uh, ultimately, wh wh where do you see is the, the biggest benefits for the, the design side? You know, we often uh, think about design processes as very disconnected uh, from, uh, from the operational side, just with the nature of the way that plants are built today. So, but we see analytics is starting to, to spread uh, in its use cases uh, across the different processes. Maybe this is just an open question for anybody on the executive panel. If you'd like to offer some, uh, some um, answers as to how you see things changing from the design side with analytics. I can uh, make a quick comment. Um, Benjamin Franklin, uh, or maybe one of his alter egos, like poor Richard, stated that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And uh, of late, the companies that are a little bit more advanced on the reliability uh, curve are looking at implementing um, at the design stage, reliability practices and processes. So anything over X million dollars, typically five to 10, they say you have to do a reliability analysis for this whole system before we ever build it. Of course, that being said, uh, just like humans, we, we sometimes don't take the preventive measure. We wait until we have to do the cure. So uh, it's best to do it early. And a lot of companies are starting to do that. but. Uh, the, the biggest apple out there is, of course, uh, improving existing systems. Okay. Any other comments from the panelists? Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll start first by saying thank you. That's the best big data presentation I've heard. That was just outstanding. Um, and, and I'm particularly taken with that hidden inefficiencies uh, aspect of, of your presentation. And I think that's one of the big opportunities as we use machine learning to sort of learn what we know we don't know and find those things on the operational side that are impacting the asset. The ability to feed that back into the design process and make those processes more robust, I think, is one of the brass rings. 
Okay. Um, maybe I'll just uh, fire away another question since I've got you all uh, I've got you all primed. So you're all working with a lot of different customers, and Dr. Priyadarshi, you know you're you know you're involved in the with the Halliburton's business. So you're you're off developing uh, solutions. So there, you know oftentimes um, this concept of the data science uh, scientist and the complexity comes up as a as a barrier. So could you just talk a little bit about that and barriers that you see for adoption in industry? I think that might help everybody understand. Oh, where do I start? Um, <laughs> I think um, uh, b the barrier is actually in understanding the value of it. Uh, if you think of people who have spent 20, 30 years doing a process in a certain way, they believe that the, what they know is perfect and they, they have been optimizing it. This is why industry talks about operational excellence, right? which itself by definition blocks you to a certain level and now beyond that you don't actually look at it. What I talk about is operations excellence, which is different from operational excellence. Operation excellence is how do I improve on my current operations and increase the value, right? And that, that thinking is required. That is a diff very different thinking. That means keep improving your process by looking at more and more. I, give, I can give you many examples. It took me about two and a half years, or roughly two years, uh, to actually get Halliburton on board with this program, uh, even though they thought that is important, but to actually make it a full-fledged pro pro solution uh, or whatever you want to call it, it, it took us two years because a lot of education is required showing the hidden inefficiencies in the data that they are actually, they have stored. And that's when it becomes a business case, right? People, everything we talk about is return on investment. And that's where most of the things fall down. Because there is no way to, just the example that I was showing of a master on, most people can't figure that out, right? And that's what they are looking. And they give us the data, they say, give me results in six weeks. That's not going to happen because you are looking for things that you don't know. So it's a very iterative process. So education is number one. Education with a very specific goal of showing them one or two examples. And once you have shown them, then they actually get on board. So currently, as, as I speak, after two and a half years, we have 34 different projects going on. And if anybody knows about Halliburton, we have 14 business lines in different areas, like exploration, drilling, and things like that. Each one of them is actually doing some project related to finding these hidden inefficiencies. The second, second part is finding talent. That is, as I think I mentioned earlier in the morning as well, in the US alone, there's a scarcity of something like 250,000. Pick the number from whichever, uh, whichever uh, consulting company you want to pick. But that's the number they say that we lack in terms of data scientists. You can't produce data scientists overnight. We haven't actually, none of the industries have actually invested in it, except for a technology company. I do come from a technology company, right, with pre-Google, so AOL, many of you have heard of it. So we built my, I built my first data science team in 2000. This is my fourth data science team in my career, right? So companies like technology companies have been ahead of this game because they realize the value of it, right? We all love Amazon, right? We buy a book and they tell you the recommendation engine and we are very happy about it. But we can't build a recommendation engine for our own systems. Today, a mechanical pump fails in, in, in whether my industry or any other industry. What do we do? We go to experts and saying, oh, this happened, tell me what happened. Why can't we build a recommendation engine? saying these are the five possible causes with this probability. Can you fix it? No, we don't, because we are not actually leveraged the data. Tacit knowledge sits in people's head. And of course, in oil and gas company, as we know, most of those people are retiring. And we have never captured that. Right, so that's the talent is uh, second biggest challenge. Uh, um, the third challenge is actually, you have to coach them on the concept of return of investment versus return of innovation. Because when you are doing things with, with analytics, it's all about innovation. Because that's how we change the business strategy. Like the example would be the uh, mining company in Australia. They actually invested in it. Today, they can actually mine by sitting in the middle of, uh, like they're sitting on Perth and the other cities and mine in the middle of the, in, in the desert, right? Completely autonomous. Of course, you know, U.S. military flies planes sitting in Arizona or anywhere in the world. So there are, there are examples that is there, but when it comes to industrial applications, we haven't gone there that far. I think if I can add to that, uh, Peter, uh, uh, in my role as, as, as we meet varieties of customers in the industrial product segment, oil and gas segment, uh, I see the various kind of, uh, you know, break into three, three different categories. 
One is, the first one is instead of uh, apprehensions. You know, is this for me? Is this uh, uh, something that will make my business uh, more lucrative? Is this, do I have the talent like uh, Dr. Satyam mentioned about? Is it a complex problem for me to solve? Is it going to compromise my data security? So there are a lot of apprehensive questions. And you know, one of the sessions before in this after, earlier afternoon, we saw some polling being done. 70% of the audience in the room you know, said that their organizations are at very early stages of either discussing the, the problem or discussing the solution or trying to do some proof of concepts. So a lot of apprehensions at this stage. And uh, the second one is the cost uh, versus ROI. Is it, is it a monster that I'm dealing with? Uh, is uh, what will be my tenure of uh, the return on the investment that I'm going to make? So that is another debate that, that, that uh, many, many companies are going through. And uh, most important is the third one, which is the organization culture. Uh, if, it, if it is a large uh, company and a conglomerate, you know, making those decisions are uh, very, very complex. And also, you know, if you're if you're uh, if you're in a in a in a commodity type of product, probably decision making is very easy. But if you're in a technology intensive um, uh, manufacturing and, and product line, then it becomes more complex. So I think uh, uh, the OCM part, the organization change management part, is 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 a big barrier in adapting to some of these new concepts and technologies. Thanks. Any other comments from the panel? Yes. Bird? I want to add one thing. Um, very good comments here. Um, there's one thing we see or see from customers coming back all the time um, is when you look to an, an implementation score of any analytics project, um, it can you can break it down in two parts. You have the value or the perceived value, but you have also minus the, the perceived risk. And risk is, for example, something like management of change. And if you want to introduce a lot of new innovation and it changes the way too much how plans operate or people think, um, like process engineers, um, it's decreasing the value for people. So you have to bear in mind that also you cannot change too much how people work. Um, and I, we think that's, that that's an important factor that a lot of, of um, companies forgetting at the moment. And uh, just a, a quick comment on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of comes back to what uh, you put up there, and, and holistic is the key word. Um, you have to look at the whole picture. And, and all of the great analytics and tools that are looking at individual uh, failures and, and uh, possible events in your system, that's just a, a, a single event. Mm -hmm. But in the holistic system, You've got a buffer tank downstream, you've got a redundant plant, you've got turn up capacity, you've got seasonal demand, you've got uh, weather issues, you've got people. Um, and unless you can quantify that as, in, as a part of the holistic system, bringing in people's capabilities, bringing in the financial, then uh, we're still not there yet because we're getting smarter on saying, hey, that thing's about to fail, but what does that really mean uh, truly to the to the business and so holistic thinking like like you showed is really the the last tier where you're you're able to place that in a context and another uh, thing that you brought up was the about the people and you mentioned 250,000 whatever the number is uh, that's going to be decades away from from uh, b being viable so you have to find ways to place the data scientist into the box put them into the machine take that knowledge and let the regular Joes out there use it uh, in the existing facilities. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the challenge, is moving from very, very interesting uh, science to where the rubber hits the road, and then finally up to the level of making a financial decision. I like the word regular Joe. But, uh, <laughs> no, but that, that's true. But there's one thing, the people you call regular Joe, they still need to be um, trained in getting analytics awareness um, because uh, there's still a learning curve on that side, even if they're regular Joes or subject matter experts. So yeah, yeah. when the tide comes in, we all have to be lifted a yeah. little bit. Mm. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, what about uh, from the audience? Any questions for the, you'd like to direct at a specific panel member or a general question to any one of the panel members? Go easy on us, it's late. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is Craig Sutton from John Deere. Uh, I'm hearing about a lot of data scientists that are, we got a gap. And then I hear this other 
emerging technology called artificial intelligence. Just uh, thoughts on whether the, art, the AI wave is gonna actually engineer us around our data scientist gap that we have? So AI is nothing new, right? We had AI in 1960s, 1950s actually, right? So it's nothing new. The computing technology enables us to use that technology now, right? The data science, so it's like, analogy I'll give is Excel has been there. All of us have used Excel. I guarantee you that nobody uses more than 5% of the capability of Excel. There are very few people who actually use 100% of all the functionalities, the complex functionality of Excel. Right, so similarly, AI algorithms exist, but doesn't mean that you know how to use them. That's where the data scientists come in, right? They know how to interpret that, what is coming out of those results. So you can, you can download pretty much open source AI algorithms now, run it against your data, but what will you do after that? That's a challenge. So th there's nothing, nothing, data scientists are needed to actually explain you what is needed in combination with the domain experts. It's not just that you put a computer scientist, uh, of course my panelist friend said that you can have any Joe run these things. It's not that easy because you can, you can run any algorithm for that matter. I can give you software now, you can take it and run it. But what happens after that? Are you able to figure out the differences in the patterns? That's more important. It's a visual component or the interpretation component is very critical part of it. Right? Many of, the, many of the people who are running a statistical algorithms, they will come and explain your data very nicely with saying, my RMS value is so and so, and after that, they can't relate it to the physical phenomena that we are talking about. So that's where, that is, that bridge has, that bridge has to be crossed. I, I guess I'd add to that, that um, I think that when you look at um, data scientists as a cultural change agent, that's an important part of the formula. Certainly there are efficiencies in putting the data scientists in the box, but for us to be amenable to what these technologies can do for us, we have to be willing to take those risks and try. And so I think the other role of the data scientist is as a change agent, and that's an important, important role. So. Just a comment on, um, since we're talking about data science uh, technology, and I know there's certainly a lot of old systems and some of the other tracks here at ARC talk about obsolete systems and we've got a whole initiative around open automation to deal with uh, Fortran and engineers today don't really get exposure to Fortran type uh, codes. Um, so my, I guess my question is, is from your experience um, attracting people to join heavy process or, or, um, or industry where keeping um, having it so that they don't go to work for Google or for Facebook and like what are your recommendations on building teams or taking chemical engineers and having them become citizen data scientists because that's another dimension about um, people that get good with data but they don't have to use MapReduce and other technologies that are uh, perhaps behind the scenes but there's, um, there's tools that they can still uh, get access to data. So recommendations for attracting people to the industries, what do you recommend? It's an open question to anybody on the panel. <laughs> I think you're best equipped to answer that. <laughs> Dr. Priyadarsha. <laughs> so I have a PhD in chemistry, uh, but nothing to, never mixed chemicals, but it's all in theoretical or quantum chemistry or what people would call quantum physics. Um, and just have to play with data for quantum level data, but as a result became a data scientist for modern businesses, right? But um, my team, I have an atomic physicist who is a PhD in atomic physics. I have a chemical engineering PhD. I have a mechanical engineering. I have a petroleum engineering. I have, uh, I have a geologist. I have a geophysicist. Uh, so all combinations of people who have actually played with data for whatever re domain they have been are actually become data scientists. How do you attract them? It's a hard question, but I think, the, in my experience, you can't micromanage them. That is one important part I tell everyone. The moment I micromanage a data scientist, he's going to go to Google, believe me. And this, this we see every time. In fact, I can tell you, in Houston recently, some big oil companies hired some data scientists, and they gave them a project and saying, I need results in X weeks, right? And the results didn't came did not come out in that many weeks because the data was not good or whatever, and they were 
they said, oh, you guys don't know what you're doing. The guy actually went and joined one of the Silicon Valley companies and is very happy there. There are a bunch of such examples. The thing is, if you are connecting data sets which you don't know, when you are and then quality of the data, people actually clean the data and give it to them. The moment you clean the data and give it to a data scientist, you already took out features from it. You see, when you take out the features, then how can I tell you when it failed? Because you already removed what you thought was an outlier. But I, if you gave me the raw data, I will tell you that your outlier has a pattern too, right? So micromanaging data scientists is one of the bad things. Of course, we are business, right? So you have the leadership who knows exactly when to balance it out. Well, that's very, very important. And, uh, and that requires even leaders to think in terms of data science terms. So those are, those are also very limited number of such people who are open to such open-ended challenges. But I think if you specify a business problem, saying these are the things we are looking for, give them enough time, ask them to find the right questions so that they can ask the right data, because even to get data in any big organization is one of the biggest challenges. Then connecting that data and then building insights, I think they will be very happy mm -hmm. because that's what they love doing it. Yeah. And so I think that's what I, has worked for me. I want to make a comment here, and this is more from the vendor side, of course. But um, what surprises is if you look to the nature of data scientists, um, the, the domain is fastly evolving. And so you need to give the guys enough free time uh, we call it technology, technology spikes or whatever. Uh, they can play with new stuff, play around without co too much pressure on delivering. Um, and it's, it's, it gives a good outcome because they come with new insights, they learn from, from other companies. And we foresee that time in each kind of guy's um, work week and it, it pays off a lot. So those guys need a free time to investigate new stuff. Yeah. Okay, thanks gentlemen. So is there a question back here? Um, maybe just a comment and perhaps a question. Um, I mean, we talk about a lot of the complexity associated with current crop of data science algorithms and software technologies. That's probably just a sign of immaturity that we haven't matured the field yet as we should, and that there's still work ahead of us. And that eventually you'll probably have to get to a point where the software runs somewhere in a cloud or somewhere in a server farm, or whatever it is, and the user isn't really aware of that, don't know, don't care. And the algorithms are there. Yes, they're sophisticated. It was built by a small, highly competent data science team, but it's now deployed enterprise-wide, and everybody's getting the benefit of that without knowing any of the complexity. Now, I don't, I don't want to know exactly how the engine management system in my car works. I trust that it works because I've tested it on a real road, and it did really well. But I appreciate the embeddedness of the technology, the maturity of the technology. And I think this is part of what the journey we have to undertake with analytics, that we get away from like it's fairy dust, because it's not fairy dust, it's engineering and computer science, right? It's just new computer science, new algorithms, or better algorithms. Um, and get to a point where it's an embedded part of the business process, it's an embedded part of the equipment that's made in a factory, that when a distillation column leaves a, a manufacturer's facility, that it's, in, that it's instrumented. Why do we instrument them in the field? Why are they not standardized? Why don't we have instruments on the trays internally? There's a whole bunch of engineering work that can and should be done to get us to a point where we have richer data and where the, the fairy dust is just more engineering, more science that, that's a standard part of what we do. And you know, yes, we have innovators that live in a central group that does good work for the company, but their handoff is not, here's an ugly model that you will have to struggle with to ever run again. It gets embedded, it, gets, it goes everywhere without complexity. So I, I agree with you. I, in the platform that I showed in my slide actually does that for, for oil and gas industry, especially the upstream side, right? Because they don't, not everybody can build these algorithms because it's very, as I said, even exploration, like you can get one square kilometer is five petabyte. How many people will get that kind of training set to do it, right? So we build those kind of things and test it out and put them into the platform. Okay, another question from the audience, please. Yeah, so let's say as an end user, when you think about trying to get to the predictive or prescriptive type of maintenance, do we really know enough to be able to, to be able to determine that, or is that really up to like the OEM that has, you know, the, the, the amount of, of, of that make model we may have may not be statistically significant versus what the OEMs produce. I mean, I'm just trying to say, so as, a, as, an OE, as an end user, can we really get to the point where we as an end user can determine what the 
predictive or, pre or, or prescriptive maintenance is, or do we really need to leverage the OEM to be able to get to that? Because we may not have the, the in, in, innate domain knowledge, or, uh, or is, is there enough data in there from this, let's say, for the small sample set that we may have in our, in our facilities to be able to make that determination? I can uh, make a comment. I was involved in maintenance for a number of years, and uh, I don't know if it's an OEM issue as much as it is um, the quality of the software that keeps learning. So um, it's going to learn on what you already have, but it's going to keep learning by asking input from the, the end user. Um, is that really a failure? Is that indication really something, an anomaly, for instance? So it's kind of a combination of end user intelligence and then the baked in uh, uh, data science that, that's, that's already in the, the tools. But I, I think it has an opportunity to completely set maintenance on its head. Uh, as Peter was saying earlier, 80 some odd percent of the failures are, uh, are not predictable. I spent 12 years babysitting, babysitting rotating equipment and looking at the design, the operations, the maintenance, the installation, and, and I can attest that it's rarely ever the actual piece of equipment that, that is causing the failure. It's something out there in the ecosystem and learning all that with the input from the end user and baking that into the, the, the data science behind those predictions. I think that combination kind of does away with the um, condition-based only or schedule-based or all those are set on its head. And it's just purely what is happening in my system in real time right now in the whole ecosystem of that piece of equipment. So I think it's still very important to have that, that end user validation to keep getting, to make that uh, uh, prediction keep getting smarter and smarter. That, that said, um, you know, I've watched for 35 years as companies try to enter the software business when they're not in the software business. And it's one thing to take a toolbox and some smart people and create a successful application. It's another thing to make that kind of technology ubiquitous, scalable, maintainable, and all those other things. So if your question is more, should I roll my own or go, go with the vendor approach, as a vendor, of course, I'm going to say go with the vendors. But go in and eyes open that if you choose to go your own route, you should set your expectations for a five to seven year battle until you get to the point that you've really justified your existence. Any other comments uh, from the panel? No. Another question from the, uh, the audience? I know it's getting uh, late in the day. The, um, when, when, this is an idea that, uh, or uh, this is a concept that I had uh, put up on one of my slides, and it's this, it's this union of process and operational d uh, data and asset data and operator logs and all this information being available and uh, like what Halliburton has done is to bring this this data together um, what recommendations are there for adjusting the work processes because it seems to be much of um, maintenance and operations is done in completely separate work processes uh, maintenance people un understand rotating equipment or they understand piping or they understand trays and, and how they work and then there's the folks that understand the process so oftentimes those two don't come together so so what can you talk about any of your experience in, in bringing uh, organizations together and changing that process because I think ultimately the you know like the gentleman said it's you know shifting to predictive maintenance or proactive operations requires some significant organizational changes so in the big data terminology, we call it converting the dark data to smart data, right? So when you have analyzed the data, right? Now when you're going to collect the future data, that becomes even smarter. So your process have improved, right? Because they, you remove the hidden inefficiencies that you found, right? And that, that get educated to the people in the field. So you, this is, that's why I was talking about continuous improvement process, right? And this is where the value comes in. And not only the way you collect the data, the way you report the data, the bits of the data, how they're going, at what speed should you collect, at what frequency should you collect, all those things get modified based on one project at a time. It's not like I can come up with an answer for everything, but as we'll see new and new things, we keep modifying them. That's the, that's the only way to do it. So that's why your process gets better and better. 
the, um, so the, any other questions from the audience? I'm gonna ask the panelists one last question. We've got one over here. Hi, I'm Crick Watterson with Falconry. I have a question for all the panel members to perhaps debate. Uh, we have a, quite a variety. We have new technology on analytics on the left. We have well-established technology and process automation and technologists in Aspen Tech. We have engineering services, and then we have a data science mentality and perspective on a, on a big company. When we think about applying advanced analytics from any one of your perspectives, from a top-down approach or from a bottoms-up approach, if you could describe from your own perspective the steps that you have to take from, from starting to operational implementation, are they different from each of your perspectives? I'm not sure. We should figure that out. Um, I think it's like a lot of things. You, you need first to have some kind of a decisioning framework that sort of points you at, at the urgent problems. And that's not as straightforward as it might seem. So our point of view on that is that you can take traditional reliability modeling. And there are people that understand that. But if I told you that I was going to improve the reliability of your home air conditioning by 25%, what would that really mean? So I think the ability to, to blend financial cost information, modeling flows and things in conjunction with reliability analysis gives us a pretty good laundry list and priority order of what we have to worry about. Because now I understand where, where the risks are and I understand the probabilities of those risks, but I also understand the financial implications of those risks. That lets me set priority. And so rather than it being a solution looking for a problem, you now have financial information that sort of guides you in where the real problems are. And then it boils down to a decision of, there are three things, things we know we know, things we know we don't know, and things we don't know we don't know. And there are technologies appropriate for those. Analytics traditionally is more about the data that I sort of know and understand, whereas I think machine learning goes the other way. It's about things that we don't know, and it's that, that discovery mechanism. So I think you gain insight from that ordering process that you go through to figure out what your technology roadmap needs to be to address those problems. That's one point of view. See, uh, from, from my viewpoint, uh, as I interface with uh, our customers and prospects, uh, I think the, uh, I was alluding to the organization culture, I think that is the most important thing that we're seeing, you know, uh, a transformation happening, and particularly the companies that are aired uh, uh, in the game are looking at having a chief digital officer that could, you know, drive those, those objectives top down. Uh, unless unless you have a promoter and then those promoters are driving the 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 organization needs from an investor point of view or operational efficiency point of view or your customer's point of view you would continue to operate in a discrete manner your outcome may not be measurable uh, and that is the transformation that we are seeing in many many corporations in trying to uh, drive that top down if that makes sense for you So um, just one last uh, comment just to the panelists before we wrap up for the day. Is there anything that we haven't covered? Is there any recommendations for folks that are considering advanced anal analytics and, and other advanced uh, technologies and machine learning? Is there, any, is there anything that we should really tell them before we, we wrap up today? Final recommendations. Mine would be be brave. <laughs> um, we can stand around and, and wait for you know, a ton of success stories to land on our desk that, that you know, shows that there's, there's potential success out there. There's a lot of emphasis on proof of concepts, which is really more a test of your organization's ability to take a technology than it is of the technology itself. This change is, is happening, and it's happening faster than many of us ever thought that it would. And so it's not a time for navel gazing. It, you know, let's get into this thing. So take some risk, be brave. Something complementary here is you see in the industry the nature of that they are afraid of, of failing projects. Mm -hmm. But if you look to what you can learn from startups and scale ups, it's a concept of um, failing forward. So mm -hmm. fail, fail fast and repeat and, and do it better next time. Yeah. And it should be also in, integrated in the mindset of the industry because 
if you talk about evolution and innovation, you will fail eventually and you have to adapt and learn and, and do it again. No one bats so, a thousand. Yeah. But the companies don't, that will not leverage big data analytics, I think there will be a disruptive company which will come out very fast and disrupt the whole industry. That is likely to happen pretty much in any, any space. Okay, gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please join me in thanking the, the panelists.